Hi, this is Steve, V6WZ. Let's talk about the two-element 40-meter Yagi designed and built by Cushcraft and now sold by MFJ, the Big Thunder XM240. I've used this Yagi and uh, modified versions of it and uh, for over two decades, and I still am using a, a version of it. You know, this Yagi is a proven performer. But, you know, let's dive a little bit deeper with some 4-neck-2 modeling uh, to see what the full band uh, performance is like and talk about the theory of two element uh, Yagis in uh, general. You know, why did Cushcraft tune the Yagi the way they did and what are the compromises and trade-offs for doing it? You know, and what mods can we possibly do to improve the uh, full band performance? The assembly manual with all construction detail, including element dimensions, is available online. So it's pretty easy to build an accurate model in uh, Fornac 2. Uh, also in the manual is a specification table, which I show here. Uh, notice that they quote the gain for the Yagi in a free space, a free space gain. And I show here uh, below is a uh, frequency sweep showing the gain run in free space from Fornac 2. So you can see it's pretty accurate. Uh, I came up with the same answer of 6 dBi uh, free space gain. Notice also the, uh, the SWR bandwidth is quoted uh, 2 to 1 at uh, 250 kilohertz. You'll see as we proceed that uh, that's pretty accurate as well. Here is a 3D geometry view of the model as built in Fornac 2. The Yagi's modeled at 21 meters or about 70 feet high. And uh, from now on, I'll be quoting the gain uh, in DBI, including ground gain. That is to say, not free space as they've done uh, in the uh, specification table. Uh, each of the four uh, loading coils uh, are modeled as a series RLC uh, using a 10 microhenries and a one and a half ohms uh, series uh, resistance to account for the uh, coil losses. In fact, here is an image uh, of the uh, photograph of the XM240 coil with the shrink wrap removed. The coils are basically 68 turns of about 12 gauge wire on a three quarter inch fiberglass form. It's about five and a half inches long. And below uh, here is a screenshot from the program coil by Brian K6STI. And it uh, uh, shows that, that uh, coil having a series resistance of about 1.4 ohms. Here's a photo of a high Q coil that I've built to replace those Cushcraft coils. Brian's program calculates the series resistance of these units to be about 0.5 ohms. If we use 0.5 ohms uh, of series resistance in our model instead of the 1.5 ohms for the Cushcraft units, uh, we, get about, uh, we gain about 0.5 uh, dB of uh, gain. But from now on, all modeling will be done using the original uh, Cushcraft units. Here's an SWR frequency sweep from the model. All of my model sweeps from now on will be the same. That is to say, uh, going from uh, on the bottom axis 6.8 to 7.5. Uh, megahertz. Here the SWR is plotted on a log scale on the left and this is all based on a 50 ohm reference impedance. You'll notice that the 2 to 1 SWR bandwidth is about 260 kilohertz. That's pretty much identical to what was quoted in the spec sheet. Let's do a far field gain plot of the Yagi at 7.120 or close to the 1 to 1 uh, SWR point. Uh, point. On the left is the uh, zenith plot, and on the right is the azimuth plot. You may notice that the front to back doesn't really look uh, uh, spectacular here. Uh, so let's have a look at a frequency sweep uh, showing the gain and front to back profile across the band. On the top is the gain profile. On the left axis is the gain going from uh, about 0 dB up to uh, 20 dB, and the front to back is plotted uh, on the bottom uh, chart. In red is the front to back, in green is something called the front to rear, and the individual values are quoted here. The yellow line is where we just did that uh, zenith uh, far field plot. You notice that the peak front to back is actually down frequency here, around 7.050. Here I overlay the SWR sweep so we can see the 2 to 1 uh, operating uh, uh, bandwidth uh, together with the gain and front to back. Let's look across the band in a bit of uh, detail. Here I show the SWR uh, value, the gain, uh, and the front to back uh, at exactly uh, 7 megahertz, right at the very bottom of the band. 3 to 1, 10.7 dBi and 9 dB front to back. 
On the far right, on the top, I have the zenith pattern, and below that, the azimuth pattern for this frequency. Let's scroll along through the band. So here we are at uh, 50 kilohertz up from there, 7.050. The gain, uh, or rather the SWR is much better, it's 1.6 to 1. The gain's gone up to 10.8 dBi, and we're close to the peak front to back of about 25 dB. Look at the pattern though, quite spectacular on this, both the zenith and the azimuth plot. Let's move further up the band, 7.1 is like this, we're down to 10.3 dB and 14 dB uh, front to back. Uh, 7.150 is uh, definitely diminishing. And you can also notice, I'm going to just continue to scroll through, as we move up the band, you'll notice that both the uh, zenith and azimuth plots are really, really diminishing here as we get up into the uh, SSB uh, part of the band. So uh, here are all the values tabulated across the, uh, across the full length of the band. So uh, from the CW end, we go from 10.7 dBi to 9 in the very top of the sideband end of the band. So we're basically down about 1.6 dB if we're all the way at the top of the band. Uh, and the other thing to notice on the front to back is the peak uh, front to back is quite narrow uh, and really focused uh, over a 60 kilohertz uh, uh, window. For any two element Yagi or parasitic array, the pattern, that is to say the gain and front to back are only determined by the tuning of the parasitic element. Well, there's also a relationship with element spacing and boom length, but that's a discussion for another day. In other words, the length, the tuning, and the resonance point of the driver has nothing to do with the gain and front to back performance metric. The driver just needs to be matched to accept RF at the operating frequency. In other words, again, the gain and front to back are entirely determined by the parasitic tuning. That is to say the resonant frequency of the parasitic. Uh, let me demonstrate that. Let's take our Cushcraft model, which has been designed to have the driven element uh, resonate at 7.120. Uh, here on the bottom graph, uh, you can see the impedance uh, sweep. In blue is the real resistance, and in red is reactance. Where the reactance crosses zero at 7.120 is resonance. You'll also notice at that same point that the real resistance is 47.5 ohms. Well, that's why this uh, antenna is a good match to 50 ohms. I put this chart together with uh, the same charts you've seen before, the front to back uh, and the gain. Now let's lengthen the driven element. You'll notice here that I've uh, made the driven element now resonant at 6.85, way down the band. You'll see where it crosses zero here. Now notice the front to back and gain charts above. I'm going to scroll with my mouse back and forth. And you'll notice that the gain and front to back uh, do not change. It's completely independent of the resonance of the driver. What happens to the SWR when we change the driver tuning closer to the maximum gain in front to back frequency? Well, let's do some runs and see what happens. Here is the stock tuning that we've already looked at. The driver's tuned to be resonant at 7.120, where it crosses zero. And here is the SWR sweep, which we've seen before. 260 kilohertz of, uh, of bandwidth. Let's retune now the uh, driver closer to or on top, right at exactly at the maximum front to back frequency of 7.055 megahertz. Now be aware when we do that, we can uh, bring the resonance point of the, YAG, of the dri driver down by lengthening the element. But notice that the real resistance that we'll be left with is 36 and a half ohms. So we're going to need to match that, perhaps with a hairpin, or we could just tune the Yagi with an L network to bring it to this frequency. Uh, when we do that, you'll notice now that the uh, bandwidth is uh, decreased to 190 kilohertz. Now let's try and tune the Yagi even lower to be right at the peak gain frequency. That's at 7.020. And as we just uh, showed here, the, the real resistance is down to 26 ohms. So we're going to need to uh, impedance match that back up to the uh, 50 ohms. But when we do that, you'll notice that the SWR has really crashed down to 100 kilohertz. Here are those same three SWR runs we just did overlaid so you can see how they compare. 
So what's going on here? Why does the SWR bandwidth get more narrow uh, as we approach the maximum gain frequency? I think this is cool and actually pretty easy to understand. Here on the impedance sweep, uh, notice at, uh, if we tune at 7.120, the rate of change of the real resistance is fairly flat, especially on the high side. Uh, however, when we uh, tune the array uh, lower in frequency at 7.055 or 7.20, notice that the real resistance is quite steep here. And that's why the SWR profile ends up being very steep, especially on the low side um, of, the, of the center frequency and more shallow on the high side. This actually represents and, and is a very classic reflector, two-element Yagi profile. Have you ever noticed this on a two-element reflector model? In actual fact, uh, if this were a director two-element array, um, the profile would be reversed. The steep side would be on the high frequency and the shallow on the low. That's simply because we're tuned on the other side of the real resistance dip. That's where the parasitic is tuned. Okay, so to recap, the front to back and the gain are defined only by the reflector tuning. You know, changing the driver does nothing uh, to the gain or front to back across the band. Uh, in other words, if you wish to tune the, the, uh, this Yagi so that we have better front to back and gain up in the high end of the sideband part of the band, uh, you're going to need to shorten the reflector. Of course, if you do that, if you recall looking at the SWR profiles, you probably won't have or you will not have uh, access to the CW end of the band. It's going to be well outside the 2 to 1 SWR window. All right, so why did Cushcraft tune the Yagi like they did? Well, they did it because it yields uh, an excellent match to 50 ohm coax without a matching network. And the SWR bandwidth can cover almost the full band. You know, it's an easy plug and play commercial design. However, you know, we do have compromised performance across the band. If you operate mostly uh, CW, uh, you know, this is perhaps a non-issue. But if you're an SSB contester, then up here, uh, you know, on the high end, you're losing some gain and the front to back uh, performance is, is actually pretty poor. So what can we do about this? Well, one, we can do nothing. You know, honestly, the XM240 is a great performer, uh, but just be aware that the performance will be poor uh, up the band, especially in the sideband section, uh, as we just showed, uh, you know, up to maybe one and a half, 1.4 dB down from the CW end. Two, you could build a full-size Yagi. Uh, you know, this narrow front to back and gain performance that we're seeing here is simply because of the shortened uh, parasitic. It's got narrow bandwidth, and that translates into narrow bandwidth uh, front to back and gain performance. Of course, associated with a full-size Yagi is expense, tower, wind load, and uh, maintenance, especially if we're talking 80 meters. You could use a Moxon design, which has slightly better uh, performance bandwidth. Uh, truly, I'm not an expert about this. Others are uh, far more knowledgeable about this design. Uh, or you could use a three-element Yagi. They are definitely more uh, forgiving. Adding that director element tends to flatten out the gain curve and enhance the front to back uh, over a greater uh, frequency range. Uh, you could use a step IR antenna. The stepper design will always be uh, optimally tuned. Or uh, you could use a switch box at each element to add small inductance to move down the band and always keep the Yagi tuned uh, close to the max uh, gain and front to back curve. Let me show you what I've done. Here's a view of my interlaced 80 and 40 meter uh, Yagi. I have switch boxes at each element, one at each of the 40 meter elements and one at uh, each of the 80 meter elements. Uh, these relay boxes, in fact, here's a zoom in. This is a photo of my 40 meter box. It's pretty old. This, is, uh, this has got to be uh, over 18 years old and still in service. This is a common mode uh, choke. This little uh, relay is uh, to ground the element to the boom when I'm transmitting on 160 meters. I shunt feed the tower. Uh, this coil uh, is tapped with four uh, relays uh, to move myself across the band. As I said, there's two of these boxes and they are identical, one at each element. Here's how it works. The Yagi is first tuned at the very, very top of the band in the SSB end. We tune it for the optimum gain and front to back as well as the preferred SWR profile across the operating window. Then the relays are activated to add 0.3 increments, uh, 0.3 microhenry increments to move the sweet spot down the band. 
And as I said, both uh, boxes are identical, one at the driver and one at the reflector. So everything is preserved, the SWR bandwidth uh, and the front to back and gain. You know, it's kind of like having five optimally tuned Yagis that span the entire band. Now, bear in mind, all of this switching is automated, which is taking uh, cat data from the radio to the station master switch box. I mean, it's transparent. I, uh, you know, the, the Yagi is following the radio. You know, it's kind of like a step IR antenna, poor man's step IR antenna. So my Yagi's always tuned for maximum gain in front to back across the entire band. Uh, using the high Q coils, uh, this Yagi can have up to a 2 dB advantage over the uh, stock or over a stock CW tuned XM240. One thing, you know, a um, bit of a warning if you ever home brewed something like this, be aware that both of these inductor switch boxes, the one at the reflector and the one at the uh, driven element, need to be identical. The, uh, the inductor increments have to be identical to keep uh, on track. You know, Turns out it's not a real trivial homebrew effort. It can be a little bit of uh, iterations to get it right. You know, it's not really a plug and play kind of project. By the way, here's a view of one of the 80 meter switch boxes. Of course, there's two of these, one at the reflector and one at the uh, driven element. A little bit different layout. I need more inductance to move across the full 80 meter band and I use vacuum relays. Uh, this 80 meter Yagi is half, almost a full, one half full size. And as a result, the SWR, I'm sorry, the uh, gain performance and front to back performance uh, bandwidth is very narrow. So I have 18 band segments to take me from the CW end of the band all the way up to the uh, phone end of the band. And within we, each one of these uh, two to one SWR windows, again, the gain and the uh, uh, S, uh, front to back is, uh, uh, is maximized. The fact of the matter is um, many will see a miniature, small, baby 80 meter Yaggies like I have and say that it can't work. And the truth of it is it can't work and it's uh, unworkable unless you implement implement some kind of switching like this. But the fact is I have a tiny 80 meter Yagi that is maintaining its uh, gain in front to back across the entire band. This is the key to uh, implementing this type of switch system. Well, you know, a full size 40 meter Yagi is a pretty uh, big antenna and a full size 80 meter beam is simply a monster. You know, the mechanical survivability of these big guys can be challenging and, you know, the construction, uh, purchase cost, as well as the install cost on a suitable tower can be substantial. You know, these loaded, short Yaggies can be an alternative. You know, in the narrow uh, performance bandwidth of these babies can be corrected so that, you know, full band coverage uh, and performance can come within a dB or so of their uh, full-size brothers. You know, this is a photo of my uh, 80, 40 meter interlaced Yagi um, at 100 feet. You know, the 80 meter elements are uh, about 60 feet long. You know, it's been in service for 18 years and it's uh, still going. 73, this is Steve, V6WZ.